I would like to point out that I didn't conceive this presentation uh, in the manner of uh, lecture with the fixed thesis or, uh, I don't know, some kind of uh, position that is definite and unquestionable, but uh, rather as a kind of opening questions that we are dealing with uh, through our work and something that I would like to actually have a discussion with you afterwards after taking out some points and uh, how do we approach the topic of uh, criticism. Uh, so the criticism is uh, one of the programs Kurzim, the organization I'm a member of, uh, is dealing with for the past uh, several years and uh, in, in this presentation I will also go through mm, the, mm, how to say, uh, some kind of line, how we got there and uh, what, is, what, are the, <coughs> what are the approaches we are trying to um, open up and to somehow bring the, the open discussion on. Uh, so, first I will start uh, by describing the framework from uh, which we came to the theme of criticism and also the context uh, from which Portal Kultupunkt uh, HR uh, has grown out. Uh, because I think that it is important since it determines uh, our approach, uh, the kinds of artistic and cultural practices we are dealing with, and also it defines uh, some kind of values and uh, principles that we are trying to uh, nourish within that uh, framework. Uh, so, for the past seven years, uh, I'm working of the, uh, as a uh, member of the editorial board of uh, online publication, uh, Kulturpunkt, uh, and it's a non-profit media uh, that was established in uh, 2005 uh, by the network of uh, independent cultural organizations in Croatia, the network Klapcek. So Klapcha was founded in 2002 uh, as the, with two aims. One of the aims was to contribute to decentralization of cultural production in Croatia and to provide platform for sharing and exchanging programs of actors from the scene. Uh, and that would be one task uh, and this is uh, in the realm of uh, decentralization policy and on the other hand is um, the, the aim or the goal of the organization was to uh, provide infrastructure for um, rethinking, thinking, articulating, uh, advocating and lobbying uh, within the uh, cultural policy institutions uh, that are defining how uh, the culture is uh, directed and uh, organized in the Croatian context. Uh, so, uh, very soon after the network started its um, uh, work or uh, shaping and uh, its um, acting and influences, uh, they detected uh, that uh, one of the ma main problems organizations that are gathered within the uh, network uh, is lack of visibility, media presentation and uh, space for mediation and reflection of this kind of cultural and artistic production. And that's why they decided to, um, how to say, um, create this kind of media platform that will provide uh, space for visibility uh, but also uh, valuation, valorization and uh, analysis of the cultural production and that's how Kulturpunkt was conceived. But um, um, it's also important somehow to explain what kind of uh, organizations are gathered in this platform. So, uh, as you know, we all belonged to Yugoslavia <laughs> and somehow somewhere in the 90s uh, this fell apart and 
many new member states uh, took their own new direction and new uh, um, governance, new values, new frameworks that they were trying to shape and formulate within uh, national states. And uh, uh, in Croatia, um, in the 90s, uh, of the past century uh, were marked by the split of uh, federation, wars in the region of Southeast Balkans, and transi to transition to the newly born countries from the communist system into democracies and uh, into this new paradigm. A uh, dominant perception of culture uh, was based on a rather conservative conception of uh, nation, tradition, and authority. So uh, the, the new role of culture was somehow to contribute and to uh, help uh, articulate and formulate this new national cultural framework and identity dimensions that uh, members of the nation will be able to uh, identify with. Uh, and these three uh, determining characteristics have, uh, have significantly changed the uh, cultural sphere and the direction in which cultural production will take course in the following period. And in such an image, there was no space for uh, culture of youth, subcultures, art uh, critically positioned towards contemporary society, new standards and values to which cultural production became subordinated have brought to a breach of well-developed and affirmed conceptual, experimental, progressive, artistic practices that were vivid in the 60s, 70s and 80s of the past century. Um, I don't know uh, precisely, uh, except very famous groups from Slovenia that were uh, well present in a wider Yugoslavian context, but in each, somehow, uh, these mm, new conceptual, interdisciplinary, uh, reflexive, critical, artistic practices were rather uh, well established and firmed in uh, Yugoslavian context. And this new par cultural paradigm somehow uh, didn't maintain the space for them. And uh, these groups of artists uh, represented separate lines in artistic production, production, dealing with search for alternative types of production and presentation of artistic works, redefining position of arts and models of mediation, opening questions on autonomy of museums and galleries, roles and deeds of institutions of society, inaugurating participative collectivistic models of work and experimenting with tactical usage of media. Uh, in since the breach of Yugoslavia, their position was uh, now changed or displaced from the, the uh, from something that that is recognized uh, cultural production in within the state framework is now pushed to the margin and is dislocated from the uh, from the institutional framework and. Uh, they somehow had to, uh, to, to find new space. Uh, so pushed on the margins uh, with the change of regime, they had to create new framework in which they will continue with the previously established practices and these practices uh, uh, were now given uh, space among civil society organizations and uh, actors that are engaged in the promotion of human rights, female rights, peace, uh, protection of minorities and affirmation of other uh, and mm -hmm. their rights. Uh, so organizations and actors engaged in this field were not recognized uh, nor appreciated by the governing bodies, but uh, oppositely uh, were regarded as disturbing elements provoking destabilization and represented a uh, threat to the newly born and emancipated national entity. These subjects found support in foreign foundations, engaged with development of democracy and continued to exist and work on the margins of the society, always regarded as intruders and disturbing elements. Their engagement and continuation of previous work was followed by the engagement of new generations interested in creation of space for the culture of uh, youth alternative types and cultural production and international streams in arts and culture. 
So the second part of the 90s is marked by the growth of actors, initiatives and organizations in the field of culture. They organized public events, concerts, protests, streets, interventions. Davidovic, a uh, cultural theorist in the study design and independent culture, states that initiators of these cultural and artistic events are artists and individuals who became active during previous decades, as well as those who leaned on their uh, work, and finally, youth uh, who taught different subcultures express their identity and affiliation. Thus, from the very beginning, uh, we can follow two directions of de development. First uh, is the one growing uh, from subculture, and the second is the one the, that would, in artistic and professional sense, belong to the insti institutional structures. I don't know whether the, the similar uh, path was followed in uh, Slovenian context, but in Croatia, this kind of alternative culture is <coughs> it could be structurally divided into these two groups, so newly uh, growing and, uh, and new, new, new unestablished cultural uh, experiences and practices from the youth culture that are growing out, and on the other hand, this something that is taken out or uh, derooted from the institutional fra framework that uh, was once uh, officially recognized, is put on the space of margin and in that period there's, for example, the, in Croatia there's a huge amount of independent performance collectives that were performing in the streets and if we would go have another theme of this uh, presentation, we could also, through their work uh, and the changes that were going on, could follow also what's going on with the public space and how is public space shrinking and being more and more uh, sold out and taken out from, from the public governance in a sense. Uh, so, uh, what is somehow common uh, to the both directions of the uh, development, uh, so the ones that are grassroots and the ones that are, uh, that are uh, established ones, uh, is also that uh, in a time that well, when the f uh, focus on the market logic and uh, more and more uh, stronger the push towards the market is uh, growing in the period, they are more um, uh, oriented towards the non-profit uh, agency and financing through foundation, foundations, donations and public funding. There are Principles are based on solidarity, inclusion, openness towards others, diversity, minorities, marginalized group. They follow international streams in contemporary culture, they are critical towards reality and the environment, they provide conditions for creating new forms and models of collective critical thinking, encourage uh, interaction of uh, artistic, cultural, technological, political and social fields. So organizations and initiatives described as independent cultural scene in Croatia in, the, in their work, work deal with theatre, dance, film, visual arts, architecture, pop culture, public sphere, literature and so on. They are into introducing new tendencies in the field of contemporary artistic practices, mostly leaning on the traditional and cri uh, tradition of critical practices of the 60s and 70s. Self-organized initiatives of the independent culture appear during 90s in all parts of uh, the country. And this period uh, of the 90s, David Davis determines, is the first phase of the development of independent culture when the first organizations and initiatives appear. So I think this um, is this giving you some kind of image of, of what kind of culture we're, we're talking about. Okay. Uh, so, uh, with such a position in the official system, uh, it was hard to obtain legitimate and recognized position, ensure sustainability, build capacities, assure development and perspective, and uh, the actors from the scene recognized networking, uh, exchange and mutual support as one of the main pillars for their sustainability, and actors decided to create networks through which they will build 
uh, their capacities, exchange content, establish space and actors for lobbying and allocating their position, role and needs. Uh, it's important not to disregard the cultural policies and influence this strategy had on them, but for the moment we will not deal with them uh, and we will conclude <laughs> this introduction on the environment uh, we work in, uh, but more importantly uh, that is growing out from and mm, uh, sorry uh, so this place uh, or space that is created through the network capture uh, is somehow the starting starting point for the Kulturpunkt and it also defines how Kulturpunkt as media is shaped and um, the other part uh, that was also determining for uh, how the um, how the, the media is structured and what approaches it is taking is also the process of uh, what's going on <laughs> on the other hand with the media landscape in Croatia in the same period. So uh, previously the public media or state media, so maybe state media would be more appropriate appropriate title for the you know, way media were structured and governed, organized and uh, duties they were given in, the, uh, in Yugoslavia. Uh, there in the second part of the 90s, uh, going through the process of uh, privatization and uh, Editorial policies of the media are mostly governed by the market sustainability, and uh, this process will uh, get even more strongly metastized in the 2000s. So the process was very slow in the 90s, but then in the beginning of 2000, commercialization was completely taking over. Uh, the way the media is governed. And in that kind of landscape, there were less and less space for the culture, and uh, what was uh, put uh, you know, under the light of media attention is mostly a commercial, spectacular character of the cultural production and something that is, didn't belong to the mainstream, that was using different strategies and uh, taking more complex uh, topics, something that is, let's say, bothering <laughs> or burdening, was not welcome in the media landscape. And uh, so, so the, culture, the, the culture that was present in the mainstream media is mostly uh, institutional culture, but it, it also mostly with the focus on um, how to say um, uh, popular culture and with uh, lower and lower attention space and approaches. But we will get back at some point uh, to to the transformation that is made media is going on in the past thirty almost 40 years. Uh, so the Kulturpunkt is somehow uh, conceived as a, a media platform that is supposed to intervene into media landscape by fulfilling these gaps that are created in, in the media landscape and focusing uh, with its content on the uh, topics and fields that uh, have troubles getting into uh, or attracting media attention. And uh, the basic structure of the portal is uh, organized in the two sections. Uh, one part is a daily uh, news system which is providing information on the events, uh, announcements, news and <coughs> also calls for applications. 
uh, in calls of, for applica applications, we mm, focused more mostly on artistic residency, support for the artists, uh, student residencies, researchers, and things alike. It's pretty similar, actually, to, to what Art Service uh, was <coughs> providing. Yeah. And the second part is a section called Ultroscope, and Ultroscope is a author-based, outsourced uh, section which <coughs> is uh, bringing uh, analytical, reflexive, critical uh, approach to different topics, and we are covering culture, uh, contemporary arts, cultural policies, media, media policies, and society. Somehow we, we started from the very uh, very small span of uh, independent culture and the, how the media is slowly establishing itself and growing on one hand and the media space in the mainstream of media was shrinking through the time. It also demanded our widening the framework in which we, uh, uh, of the teams and fields we are covering and dealing with and somehow we are, our um, position is that uh, it's um, in a way very um, complicated, hard and uh, incomprehensive to follow uh, culture without uh, taking into account or paying attention on uh, the fields uh, or mm, the spaces that are deeply influencing and somehow are intertwined and interconnected with what uh, culture is producing, so to, to neglect the context on which the, the culture is uh, reflecting upon and taking inspiration, find, finding questions, anticipating and so on. Uh, so, in uh, 2009, in order to uh, ensure long-term stability of the portal, uh, Network Culture brought strate strategic decision uh, to begin the process of uh, spinning off or s separating portal into new organization and uh, it decided to uh, found new organization which is now the platform for media culture, uh, for culture, media and uh, society uh, that was established in 2009 and it took over managing portal but immediately it also started developing different projects that will uh, ensure uh, portal sustainability, so sustainability of the media uh, and uh, in that sense uh, media dictates the course of development, direction uh, and defines uh, the growth of other activities. So in the process of uh, development we created three projects. One of them is the criticism we're talking about uh, today, <coughs> past, present, future, and uh, then archiving project uh, entitled Alphabet of Independent Culture. And the third one is an uh, educational program called the Bond Journalistic School, which is uh, s in part similar to uh, STTR's educational program, Rolesa Sudobu Metnus. So the idea is to, uh, to somehow provide uh, young authors and uh, critics and journalists, future journalists with the insight into the disciplines and uh, cultural and artistic practices that are still not part of the form formal educational curricula and on the other hand uh, mentored uh, support in uh, gaining and attaining writing skills and uh, journalistic techniques and tools. Uh, so all of them have grown out of portal and in a way have overgrown it but still are uh, make the, uh, and have a strong relationship with uh, portal and um, in, in a way we have created some, some uh, organically interconnected and intertwined uh, segments of the organization and uh, there are several reasons uh, for this kind of strategy. 
Uh, and the most important or crucial one is definitely uh, sustainability. And uh, since the sustainability of the non-profit media is <coughs> uh, complicated tasks uh, and there is no sufficient resources for funding them, uh, and they are shaped in the way that uh, they fulfill the gaps uh, in the system, focusing uh, on the themes that uh, mainstream mass uh, commercial media, uh, as well as public media, are uh, unable to do by their configuration. Uh, so non-profit media <laughs> somehow oppose the idea of profit and <laughs> uh, using strategies that would make them commercially sustainable, but also as um, regulations in, in this media space are pretty uh, complicated and uh, restrictive in the sense that they're focusing on the uh, uh, on, on the uh, free market uh, basis and traditional uh, market competition, that would be market competition. So the, 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 the market competition is a baseline on of the, all the policies for the media and all the programs of support for the media are in that sense uh, not very welcome. So in, in that sense, we decide we, our strategy to um, create and develop other programs was somehow to um, to um, to maintain or ensure stability and sustainability of the portal, and uh, that's how we come to criticism. <laughs> so uh, one of the programs. Uh, that we created is uh, that, that we run since 2010 is uh, criticism past, present, future, uh, and this program is um, we initiated with the partners from the region, uh, Buxa from Zagreb, uh, Beton and Sikalt from uh, Belgrade, and Plima from Montenegro. And our uh, main idea was to um, create space and platform for exchange and to educate new young authors and critics. Uh, also, the idea of the project was to uh, re-establish connections or re-bridge connections between countries that were once uh, unique. Uh, cultural space and uh, shared many values, many uh, many content, many authors, many streams that we exchange among them. And uh, since the split of the previous federation, this uh, the communication also broke. And our idea or wish was to uh, see. How, uh, how the developments uh, took direction in each of the countries, so what were the mutual points that we remain and what that remained the same between the countries and what, uh, what were new directions that were taken uh, in each of them. So uh, we created this, uh, criticized this project that was uh, based on uh, one side education of young students and uh, providing them uh, mentored uh, support in uh, uh, gaining and acquiring uh, critical uh, methodology. And uh, on the other hand, to uh, open up discussion on a regional level uh, on different neurologic points that we find, found, found that are still um, active and important for uh, each of the countries and in our mutual relations. The, those were uh, national myths, identity and uh, confronting the past. Uh, and uh, I also need to excuse here uh, because uh, we are trying to re-establish new federation without Macedonia and Slovenia. 
But this kind of decision was brought on the basis of uh, language, because uh, we still, uh, though we didn't have a partner from Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina was uh, part of the pro project. Uh, so we decided to uh, remain in the framework of the same language, uh, because Macedonian and Slovenian already took different course of development and in uh, our collaboration with the uh, Slovenian partners and with uh, some Macedonian organizations and also partners, uh, we discovered that actually new generations is uh, um, that doesn't understand uh, this common Serbo-Croatian language that once was. So we decided to, in this very complicated uh, structure of the project, not to intervene with one more uh, layer of translation and I'm sorry, <laughs> we will do the next round with uh, all the member states and uh, but uh, what was in a way um, something that will remain the continuous uh, line or this kind of red line of our interest that uh, turned up in this uh, process of structuring and implementing project was this educational uh, mentoring mode. So the, um, this function in a way that uh, we had three cycles and for each cycle we would uh, recruit uh, six students for each discipline uh, we were dealing with contemporary uh, visual arts, uh, performing arts and uh, literature and for each discipline we would recruit, uh, I think six but maybe eight, I'm not sure anymore, uh, students uh, who would work with one-to-one uh, -one mentoring support uh, on different uh, theatre piece, gallery exhibition, uh, book or whatever. Uh, we would start with a um, conference and then the process of uh, mentored work would go on and th their text would be published. And the idea was that, for example, uh, students from Serbia would come to Croatia, see the performance and write about it, so to give um, this kind of different, uh, 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 an insight and view that is different from the one that our context is dictating and also uh, that who wouldn't be burdened with the relations that each of us is having in the community. But, and then we said like, okay, we will teach them to write critique. But what is critique? And we started discussing what is critique for each of us and how this, um, uh, how is this mm, possible in a way? and uh, to, to say what would be the criticism for me and what would be for someone else. And uh, we actually uh, started a project with the kind of slogan that was formulated as uh, criticism is dead, long live the criticism. So we will, like, we will bring back the criticism to life. And then we said like, but this is false actually, because if you look at the, what's going on with the criticism, then uh, there is no criticism in the mainstream media. There is no criticism anymore in mass media. You can, you, you, you probably remember uh, still that, I don't know, there were sections and you would have every, on a weekly basis supplements that were covering literature, theater, film, music, whatever, and very, very comprehensively give uh, insight into what's going on in the cultural space. So. Now you can find from time to time that the, the cultural sections which are shrank to one to two pages and criticism is actually very scarce. So the, 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 this kind of uh, statement that criticism is dead uh, <coughs> is, um, between false and imprecise in the sense that is uh, imprecise because criticism is still present but uh, in it's dislocated in different media outlets. It doesn't necessarily uh, live continuously and extensively in the in, in the 
in the mainstream and mass media, but uh, on the other hand, there's a lot of outlets, specialized publications, blogs, uh, new media platforms, and many spaces that criticism appear. And uh, in that sense, we decided that somehow we have to, uh, mm, we want to open uh, a wider uh, discussion on what's going on uh, with the with the, the media and how uh, how the criticism is um, is in a way finding its space in this new uh, structure. Uh, so the change in media is started in the uh, early 90s and. Uh, this process of commodification, the process of uh, approaching media, journalistic work and content, content uh, as a kind of, um, uh, um, industrial work that can be done by anyone and that can be uh, produced by anyone and in any space is taking more and more uh, space in the media production and is provoking uh, deprofessionalization which is demanding so which is demanded by the re reduction of expenses and criticism uh, reports uh, research journalism and so on are forms that demand a lot of money and many people being engaged and involved. So all these forms are somehow um, vanishing from the media space and this industrial work PR is taking over and predominating the, the, the media landscape. Uh, and this also is changing and transforming the way uh, media work is made and done and it's uh, calling somehow out the new types of work and uh, inducing precarization uh, and it, in the past 15 years uh, it's very often uh, that the blame is put on the internet but actually the internet only accelerated this process uh, because it really started uh, some 20 years ago before before the World Wide Web was uh, in our thumb and <laughs> taking the shape in our daily life. So, uh, um, what is actually good about internet <laughs> is that it also, uh, in this kind of uh, restructuring and reshaping of the media landscape, uh, offered uh, different kind of uh, space and approach and opened uh, the mm, possibility for mm, for the ones who were uh, deprived uh, or didn't have capacity to participate in the media that they can have their own media that they can work there uh, and it's also the other blame uh, that is put on uh, on the internet is uh, is the fact that people are getting debilitated and that they are uh, not capable anymore to consume huge amounts of text and that they don't understand that they're not disinterested and so on so I just wanted to show you uh, recently I found, I found uh, a study that uh, shows that somehow the, the all these threats that were um, uh, that were supposedly uh, attached to the internet and that it, it will destroy this capacity uh, <coughs> it uh, proved to be false so a recent survey says that uh, young generations are more prone to reading than watching and listening so there's still reason to write long text <laughs> okay and uh, in this um, in this kind of new uh, new media framework and 
I wouldn't say it's defined. I still I think that it's in a continuous change and that it's continuously finding new spaces, new structures, new new forms, new mm, and we don't know how it will look like in five or ten years. I really can't preview what will happen in two old two twenty one, for example. Uh, with the media, uh, but I also find this uh, process interesting and um, optimistically regard on it. And on the one hand, uh, the criticism is uh, dislocated uh, in different media outlets nowadays, so it can be found in blogs, in specialized publications, social net networks, all around the internet. And to me it seems that sometimes uh, mm, someone's Facebook critique can be more elaborate and substantiated than the ones I can jump uh, bump into, for example, mainstream mass media. And uh, I think that um, this kind of process uh, and these new formulations of the media landscape uh, are somehow um, opening the question to the criticism and critique itself uh, on the question how it will appear and what is the form that is it's taking on itself. Uh, so uh, it's interesting that you can find a lot of manuals on writing criticism. For example, I, I was reading recently, I was interested in how um, what kind of uh, strategy and what kind of uh, methodology these manuals are uh, offering to mm, the critics. And I took one, but there's probably a m huge amounts of these how-tos. So, uh, a, a, a renowned visual art critique, uh, Jolda Williams, uh, wrote this How to Write About Contemporary Art. And I think that this um, reader actually gives you a very nice uh, overview of the methodology and st strategy that could be used in approaching art piece. Uh, it takes into account all the changes in the art field uh, and the problems of interpretation of uh, arts that, is, uh, that arts are imposing on us today. Uh, it acknowledges that uh, measures, canons, analysis and approaches that were once inevitable and canonical are actually not viable or um, functional anymore. Uh, it also attempts to give uh, the tools and strategies how to write about art, uh, whatever we decide to call art. <laughs> uh, but I think that it's actually very hard to say that there is a recipe how to write about art. I don't actually believe in the, that. I think that these kinds of strategies can help you how to structure the text, but it can be uh, it, uh, it can be applied to any kind of text. It doesn't necessarily mean okay if you write like this, then this is criticism. If not, then it's not. And uh, I think that it also, this is also um, opening another perspective from which the criticism is uh, in a certain kind of um, unstable terrain, and that is the question of arts itself. And uh, the past century has uh, pretty much changed the, the way that arts are uh, mm, expressing themselves, uh, languages that it's using, uh, strategies that it's uh, trying to develop and open fields in which it, it is expressing. So um, that somehow if we are talking about conceptual art, and if we are talking about processual art practices and so on, it doesn't necessarily have a, a material uh, output as its uh, final work and it doesn't necessarily mean that this final output is what is most important about it. So uh, I think that in the art is uh, some, somehow uh, having this kind of uh, sensory 
capacity to re, uh, to detect the pulse of the society, dynamics in politics, dynamics in its environment and surrounding, and it's also using different methodologies and different strategies, different languages, different approaches to talk about these dynamics and that uh, the canons that we used to know and uh, that were once um, unquestionable about writing about art are somehow un dysfunctional in a way today because it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> so I think that the, the criticism is in, in, in a way uh, in the intersection between these two radical transformations and this, uh, this is demanding uh, from the art criticism to rethink how it is, uh, how it will articulate itself. And uh, I think that it, it, uh, it is actually uh, an interesting and it could be regarded as inspiring uh, challenge to regard and re-regard these uh, these influences. So once the critique was uh, unquestionable authority that had the power to take uh, the piece of art into heavens or to bury it down to the ground, you know, and people would expect the newspapers to appear and to see how it is, uh, how how the, the how piece is valorized. And uh, it was interesting, for example, to read some uh, some statements and interpretations. So, um, as for example, Lewis, the father of uh, literary criticism, formulates uh, this in the uh, in his uh, uh, mass civilization and minor minor minority culture. Minority capable not only of appreciating Dante, Shakespeare, Baudelaire, Hardy. Uh, to take major instance, but uh, of recognizing their latest successors constitutes the consciousness of the race or of a branch of it at a given time. Upon this minority depends our power of uh, profiting by the finest human experiences of the past. They keep alive the subtlest and most perishable parts of tradition. Upon them depend the implicit standards that order the finer living of an age, the sense, that the center is here rather than there. In their keeping is the language, the changing idiom upon which, uh, uh, upon which fine living depends and without which distinction of spirit is thwarted and incoherent. By culture, I mean the use of such a language. So, from this perspective, criticism probably uh, could have been thought uh, by the manuals, such as one that uh, we mentioned uh, before, uh, but uh, today, some strategies and canons uh, that were once established are actually questionable today. And are they still adequate or uh, what is their role today? How can they be applied? And maybe they could be reformulated. Uh, so on the one hand, we could mock Levis for his conservative attitude, discriminatory thesis and arrogant approach. Uh, and he was and has been regarded as embodiment of problematic endorser or literary canon, and many critiques uh, by trying to uh, oppose him are actually trying to uh, point out that they moved beyond and that uh, they emancipated themselves from his, his backwardness. Uh, but it can also be read in another way, and as uh, Terry Eagleton pointed out in his uh, literary theory, anything can be literature, and anything which is regarded uh, as unarguably and unquestionably literature can cease to be literature, meaning that there is no such thing as a literary work or tradition which is valuable in itself, regardless of what anyone might have said or came to say about it. So this brings us to the theme of taste, uh, uh, that each, uh, each time, each area, each environment has in its own, uh, has its own taste. And we could uh, use some help from Baudrillard uh, to approach the question of taste, who states that taste uh, is completely culturally acquired, uh, 
which is not new, but we he also writes in the distinction of social critique of judgment of taste, whereas the ideology of charisma regards taste in a legitimate culture as a gift of nature. Scientific observations shows that cultural needs uh, are the product of barb upbringing and education. And by thinking that taste is instinctive, we are going towards emancipation from Lewis and his backwardness, but the taste here is important as a necessary impulse for dealing with something, the hell reflecting upon it, and of course thinking and thinking critically about it. But is the taste the, that which is crucial in art criticism? Of course it makes an important part, but it doesn't have to be determining. Is educational background in art that which is essential for being critique? Is an art historian more competent for interpreting conceptual art piece or an artwork that is questioning cultural institutions uh, than a political theorist? Is a theorist of theatre more competent in interpreting communi uh, community art practices than a sociologist? Just to put into mirroring most obvious possibilities. So, who is the one saying which art interpretation is more valid? Uh, if we go back to Arthur C. Danto, late critique and philosopher who wrote uh, unfamiliar new art is mystifying without pro provision of a context which can be provided by the artist or another specialist art writer, such as a curator, academic or critic, legitimizing the necessity of an uh, educated, authorized art interpreter. Uh, so, um, in that sense, uh, I would like to show you a video that is uh, uh, actually trying to, uh, <clears throat> to legitimize and uh, show the importance of uh, critique. Because today we live in a world where anything can be art. Since then, I've tried to show you why that's the case. Together, we've explored so much. But now, in our final episode, I need to tell you why I was wrong. But before I do that, Please grant me this one last indulgence as we explore the tradition that brought me here. The history of the art critic. In the beginning, there was art. Then, there was religious art. Then, art academies. Then, art galleries. Art dealers. Art auctions. Art prizes. Art press. Art critics. Art curators. Art advisors. Art fairs. Biennales. Prop sponsorship. Until eventually, it became very difficult to find the art in the art world. <coughs> why do we need art critics? Or more to the point, why are you watching this video? In a minute, I'll start explaining the relevant history and theory, and do so with enough arrogance to convince you that I didn't just copy it from Wikipedia. You will relax and start to enjoy the way that I criticise things that you already didn't like. By the time I start criticising something that you do like, you might just go along with it. After all, I am wearing an excellent suit. Because, at the end of the day, we accept authority because we want to. Authority is comforting because it allows us to no longer think for ourselves. So, if it's as simple as that, do we really need art critics? Let's consult the history book one last time. Criticising art is surely as old as art itself, but the profession of art critic is a modern invention. Before the 19th century, art criticism had been a vocation, but the rise of the middle class and the arrival of everyday print media meant that criticising art could be a legitimate profession. Critics worked for newspapers and specialist art journals. Commercial galleries would buy advertising space in those publications, and even pay critics directly for promotional reviews. But some art critics are more than just covert salesmen. They treat their writing as an art form in itself, and the history of art is full of silent partnerships between artists and critics. Ruskin and Turner, Baudelaire and Delacroix, Fry and Post-Impressionism, Greenberg and Abstract Expressionism. To be a great art critic, you need great art, but you also need a bit more than just that. History tells us that the art critic requires a few main ingredients. A steady flow of art to criticise, and a media platform. Critics are partly defined by their platform. It's the thing that elevates them from being a howling lunatic living amongst some dumpsters. But finally, in order to be truly great, 
an unpredicted needs an audience as well. An influence is newly defined and in need of validation. An audience who needs art to define their identity and confirm their status. Whether it's for the French Republic, the English middle class, or the new American Empire, critics can translate art into vehicles for an audience's own identity. It helps for the critic to have a platform that speaks specifically to that group of people. But ever since the Enlightenment, art has become easier and easier to access, and so has art criticism. We've been through the age of the televised art critic who spoke down to us from the biggest platform of all. But today's audience talks back. So what future is there for the critic, now that everybody has their own platform? And what future is there for art? without its pedestal. Today, the borders between art and everyday culture have completely disappeared. Today, art can be appreciated with the same ease and enthusiasm that we apply to film, fashion, cartoons, and pornography. You don't need a sophisticated theory, all you really need are your senses. Yet somehow, the art world manages to maintain the illusion that their art possesses some magical quality that's somehow absent from all other forms of culture. This, ladies and gentlemen, is nonsense. And it's also why we need the art critic more than ever. But today, it's difficult for critics to hold authority, because for the first time in history, everyone has access to their own media platform. And that's why I don't believe that the art critic is obsolete. Today, they're just being reinvented. You don't need a faultless grasp of theory, or even an encyclopedic knowledge of art history. All that you really require is that your senses are working correctly, and so is your internet connection. Ah yes, the internet. That brave new tool, capable of elevating anyone to the status of art critic. All you need is a suit and an opinion, and you too can join the likes of Ruskin, Fry, Greenberg, Saltz, and Hughes! History teaches us one certain thing. That critics, when they fish out the crystal ball and start trying to guess what the future will be, are almost invariably wrong. Look, if you have learnt anything from this series, I hope you can see that nothing changes everything. And the same goes for the internet. Old power structures are just replaced by new power structures. Today's revolutionaries are tomorrow's establishment. So, be revolutionary. Just know that one day you'll have to let it go. So this video is a uh in a way, uh, I think that it, uh, it's bringing us, uh, in a way, to the question of what criticism uh, is nowadays, um, and somewhere in the line, and also in the opposition with the statement in this uh, video, I think that uh, I would define it as interpretation of art piece uh, from one viewer to another uh, and this other viewer is an author uh, of the piece while the other, uh, the one that is creating the message for the audience and that the other viewer is also the one who came to consume this message and anyone who has the taste uh, or doesn't uh, necessarily have taste but uh, in a sense liking the piece, but taste uh, in sense for venturing into the gallery, reading books, stopping by the performers on the street and coming late on a meeting because of the unexpected event, uh, and finds valuable investing his time and concentration and attention and interest uh, in what someone else is doing, uh, is in a way valuable uh, and the, the one who is possible and capable. Uh, of mm, giving a certain kind of uh, insight and comment and uh, reciprocity to what the art is trying to communicate. Uh, and to 
slowly come to conclusion. Uh, I would like to quote um, Matthew Gulish, uh, a member of a U uh, American performance collective, Gold Island, who said, uh, we may agree on the premise that each work of art is at least in part perfect, while each critique is at least in part imperfect. We may then look to each work of art, not for its faults and shortcomings, but for its moments of exhilaration, in an effort to bring our own imperfections into sympathetic vibration with these moments and thus effective and creative change in ourselves. These moments will of course be somewhat subjective and if we don't see one immediately, we will out of respect look again because each work contains at least one, uh, even if by accident. We may look at the totality of the work in the light of this moment, whether it be a moment of humour or sadness, an overreaching structural element, a mood, a personal association, a distraction, an honest error, anything that speaks to us. So, to conclude, in my opinion, the major change that happened with the criticism uh, is a switch that it happened uh, to its own character. Uh, in the traditional perception of criticism, <coughs> uh, the, its starting character was negative. It doesn't mean that criticism is always negative. It just means that the starting point from which we perceive and regard it criticism is that it's putting into question and uh, bringing some kind of doubt, valorizing something, and it, the, the approach to it uh, induced fear and uh, it's still inducing and it, that's what is giving it its basing and starting point the negative character and today I would say that the criticism in that sense changed its omen and became neutral and that it's a mode of communication, it's interpretation, it doesn't necessarily uh, have to be negative nor positive, uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, end up with the concluding some kind of uh, valorizing points from between 1 and 10. It's just a certain kind of interpretation, someone's view and wish to share this view with others, and from there on, any form, any strategy, any approach is possible and plausible, any language and style is valid, and of course, everyone is legitimate to be critic. But then again, what is necessary is actually that you're able to, if you're <coughs> criticizing something and <coughs> talking about something, what is necessary is actually to uh, be consistent, consistent in your argumentation and in a way you are um, explaining your attitude and interpretation you're trying to give. Thank you. Thank you.